Hey, everybody, and welcome to the UX group conversation. Um, I'm Jackie Bauer. I'm one of the UX managers on the in the UX department. So looks like, Sid, you have the first question. Yeah, first post. Um, well, congrats to everyone on uh, on the slide number nine. Like we beautified our UI and we did 170 things and we burned something down to zero, which I think that's a company first. So congrats on that. And can you tell like, how did we get to do something all the way like that? That doesn't some many times you have something new coming up before you're done. Like, how did you do that? Christy's so happy. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we, we, the team worked really hard on that. We had lots of people contributing and we were determined. We just did it. <laughs> well, I think I'd it's love, amazing. I'd love to hear Marcel Van Rimmerden was a huge driver on this. I'd love to hear him chime in. Sure. Um, it's been an amazing team effort. I had the most fun bringing all the people together and there have been so many designers been involved so many in designers who made the first contribution actually in the code and it's been amazing to see all of this so I'm very happy to see how that went down and yeah it's been an amazing epic and, and how how did this like did you get to did you manage to like convince the product managers to schedule things did the UX people just get in the code themselves and fix things. It's probably a combination, but how did you manage to like execute on, on each and every one? Yeah, you mentioned it perfectly. It was definitely a combination. And we really wanted to focus on making it easy for everybody to, to contribute for the first time in code. So that's why Annabelle, for example, did a great job in creating a small tutorial for designers how to make code changes and how to put them into the GDK and how then to create the merge request, how to ping people, and basically showcasing the entire flow as a designer from the code perspective. Um, there has also been an amazing effort from people scoping down things. Jeremy was amazing in helping us find small issues that we can attack, helping us throw out issues that would bring up the scope. Um, same for Jarek, he has been tremendous in making sure that we focus on the right things. So it's really been a combination of all of this. Awesome, great work. And I hope that tutorial by Annabelle is, is somewhere where uh, not only people at GitLab can find it, but or at GitLab the company can find it, but also the wider community make sure that we they, that they see it too. Definitely. I We already linked it in a couple of places and I'll make sure to also drop it into the agenda here. Awesome, thank you. Um, can you elaborate a bit on slide uh, seven, the UX scorecards for category maturity? How, how are we going to determine what the category maturity is? And if the answer is, we just have the UX designer give a statement what they think, I'm fine with that. Um, might ask a follow-up question, but first of all, I kind of want to hear what the ideas are. So the idea is to talk to end users and to do some, some user research with the people who are actually using the product and the features and find out from them if uh, they agree with our assessment of the category maturity. We want to be less subjective and more objective about the assessments. Um, I think that's that's great. And I think we should, uh, we should probably... Um, it might be linked already, but I think we should have a, a link from the category maturity page to kind of like how we how we do that. And a proposal I have, uh, what I wonder what people think is, we got to make sure we dog food. Like if we don't use it ourselves, we're not there yet. So I could see a criteria in order to get viable. The majority of the we have to use it for a substantial amount at GitLab. And in order to get complete, we have to completely exclusively use this at GitLab. So for example, service desk could not be complete because we still use Zendesk, which is awesome software, but we still use Zendesk at GitLab. So it can never be complete. And it cannot, and it cannot be viable until at least one significant team uses it. I think the IT team is trying to use it. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think we can add that to our criteria 
for how we assess these. Cool. Yeah, think about it. Thank you for your response. Jackie, I don't see any more questions. Should we end early? Uh, we can. Oh, we typing. Okay. I well, while someone's typing too, also I would point out. I think um, it's worth pointing out on slide thirteen that um, there are some new UX research training materials available in the handbook, and you know the intended audience for these would be product managers and product designers to sort of feel more confident during research with users. Um, but anybody in the company who's interested in learning how to better talk to our customers um, about our product would benefit from checking out these research materials. Also, I want to call out slide 50 that I think that's, it's very rare to see 100% of OKRs uh, completed. So that tells me we're not ambitious enough, but for now I'm gonna say great job on the, uh, on the OKRs, great job driving all those things uh, home. That's amazing. We'll make sure not to hit 100% this quarter. <laughs> <laughs> it's the other thing, it's setting more ambitious goals, but uh, we're both kidding, thank you. Okay, my question is, who's the best person to talk to in UX about dog fooding? The best person to talk to about UX, about dog fooding? Well, probably your um, UX manager counterparts for your stage groups that you're working with, I would say. I think um, anybody on the UX team should be able to talk to you about that. I think. Jamie, you're probably specifically referring to, well, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm making an assumption, but um, you can definitely talk to me about it and I can get you to the right place. <laughs> yeah, as um, what I like to call back office, we don't always understand how engineering is organized, especially um, if you don't typically interact with product or engineering. And so when we do have um, a desire to use the product in new ways, um, besides opening a feature request, how do we provide that feedback and get it reviewed regularly? And you're talking about trying to use the product in new ways in terms of um, from a less engineering standpoint. Yes, and it yep. might not even be new ways. It might just be um, how to make it more usable for us. Mm -hmm. um, or, and when I say us, I'm talking about people who aren't engineers or developers. Um, and maybe that's something that we can synchronize with Farnoosh about. Um, come up yeah. with our operational process for providing that feedback. I think talking to her about that would be good. We've talked before and you know, I'm, I'm really interested in that as well. Um, and so just to sync up with me and I've been talking to Farnoosh a lot too about some product operations things, so. Let's chat about that. Thank you. Sorry, it looks like I'm a, um, yeah, and I, this is legitimately a question from me because I know little about it, although I was really excited to see it. Can you talk more about uh, the sketching session that Geo did? It was a cross-functional sketching session, as I understand it, that's on slide 38. Yes, I don't know if the product designer is on the call. That was Sun Jung Park who worked on this with the GEO team. But I, I was the one who added it to the deck because I think that it's a really great example of how we might take um, like design methods that have typically been happened uh, synchronously in a studio with a bunch of people together and a whiteboard in order to um, 
leverage the ideas of the entire team visually, right? So sometimes we're in issues and we're talking a lot in text and we're going back and forth and we're describing things textually, but that's not always the best way to get the ideas of the team out because we have different ways of communicating via writing. So um, this sketch session was meant to allow all the members of the team, whether it was a product manager or an engineer or a quality person to share what was in their brain in terms of like what might be a better experience for this particular um, part of the, of GEO. And um, it's ongoing. So there was, there's going to be another step that's going to be a synchronous meeting, I think, where the team will get together and they'll use mural and they'll have kind of another level where they can kind of um, like take all of the different ideas that were made available and then kind of, you know, go through and pick the best ones and iterate on those. Um, but I think um, I would love to see us on the UX team do more activities like this and pull some of our thinking into the more visual area rather than just in text, because you really do get a completely different kind of perspective when you stop writing and you start drawing. It sounds like it's a asynchronous design sprint to me. Yeah, that was how it was set up. So there was a problem. If you look in the issue, there was like a problem statement um, and then a request for like, you know, share your ideas on this topic. And then asynchronously, people drew paper and took photos and uploaded the photos and then left a few comments in the issue just to kind of describe some of their um, sketches and their ideas. That's awesome. I, I think Mural might actually have a template for doing design sprints. So I wonder if there's a way to incorporate that with that concept of sketching you know, on your own time and then uploading it to that. I don't know. It'd be something to look into. It's I'm sure. A cool idea. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I mean, in this case, I think it was nice to use use an issue, and potentially we could maybe use the design tab um, on those issues some way in the future. So. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking. <laughs> All right, the next one I think is from me and I just wanted to address um, maybe this question to Tori to give us a little bit more updates on the uh, pajamas and building reusable components as a super important part of uh, like this connection between front end and UX uh, uh, collaboration and productivity. I know that we are working on like bringing in more UX maintainers, uh, kind of like curious where does this uh, process go and maybe some um, important Call, call outs there. Yeah, so the slide 11 shows the issue board that we have in pajamas, which highlights all of the foundational components that still have uh, items left to either create the documentation, the usage guidelines, or build out the component in GitLab UI or style it correctly according to pajamas specs. So there's 14 left that we have to complete. Most of them are either close to being done or just have a few things to wrap up, which is great. Once we kind of burn down all of these components, then we'll start shifting our focus more towards integrating them into the product. And we already have a lot of the GitLab UI components in prod already, but there's some complexities with uh, the fact that we're using Haml and Vue within uh, production. And so there's some things we need to figure out about how to make that easier just to use pajama components. Um, we are adding more uh, UX maintainers for pajamas, like you mentioned. It's an OKR that we have just for our team. Uh, and we want to be able to do that so that we have the same ratio that engineer has set up for the number of maintainers to designers. So we're aiming for one to five. Um, and hopefully by the end of this quarter, uh, we'll have that because we've already identified four other designers who are interested in being maintainers. So now we're just kind of working on helping them um, train up so that we can make them maintainers. Does that help answer your question, Nadia? Exciting, exciting also to hear the interest from people to yeah. becoming a maintainers and exciting to seeing the big efforts there. Yeah. Thanks for asking. I have a question about the tool stack and this can be taken offline and answered later. Um, just 
looking at our tool stack for UX, do we have the right descriptions? Do we have all the tools that um, UX is using listed on the sheet? And um, this question I'd like to know right now, um, does UX have all the tools it needs? Jackie, you want me to take this one? Yeah, I was gonna say, this is probably a question for you or, and or Sarah. <laughs> yeah, uh, so the answer is, do we today, literally this moment, have all of the tools that we need? No. Uh, do we have a plan for how to do that over the course of this upcoming year? Yes, uh, it's been planned for in the budget. So <clears throat> pardon me, some tools we'll be adding it looks like we're going to add Figma and actually replace Sketch with Figma. Uh, I know that Sarah is looking at Dovetail uh, for research. So we've got some things like that coming up. Um, I did open the spreadsheet um, and I, I wasn't sure how to sort it to get just at the UX stuff. So anyway, Jamie, happy to talk to you more about this and make sure that the descriptions are accurate. No problem. I have the next one. I'm Sarah in Marketing Ops. There was a recent uh, update to issues where you can denote an issue as a blocker. And if UX was part of that work, I just wanted to thank you because it's super helpful. So. Uh, I, I don't know. Is there anybody on the call who was part of that? I was a part of that. This is Holly on the plan team. Yeah, thank you. I'm so glad to hear that people are enjoying it. It was definitely um, a really fun project to work on, an exciting project. I think that uh, Alexis, I believe, also spent some time on it. So it was kind of a, a team effort for sure, but it's good to hear that people are, are happy with it. Thanks for the feedback. Thank you. I think I'm the next question. Um, it's not a question, but it's a statement. I love the presentations and I think that questions took a while because the presentation is beautiful, interesting and extensive. I think people were just checking that out. So well done. It looks amazing and very interesting. Um, yeah. Slide 34. It's great to see some growth experiments on .com, getting our users to not just use us for version control, but multiple things. Very excited. Are there any plans to roll this out to self-manage? I can imagine that we first want to do an experiment to see whether it works and whether people complain and dot com we have more control. And then when it works, we bundle it up and ship it to self-manage. But I wonder what the thinking of the growth team and the UX team is on that. That's exactly right. Um, I don't know if there if there's a PM or another product designer on growth who wants to weigh in, but we're working on um, being able to run faster and better experiments in .com. And then we're also thinking about how to do them in self-managed. Uh, sometimes we might wanna actually do a different experiment in self-managed only. Um, and we have to be able to get the data back from, from, that, from that tool. Um, and we need to be able to get enough data that we, can, we don't have to let the experiment run for months and months in order to know if it was successful or not. So we are working on all of that. Um, and I could potentially find um, later a couple of other specific issues that are self-managed focused. Cool, thank you for that. Um, and the next question too, I see uh, that we're working on GitLab spaces and I think it's very valuable to do discovery there. There's just clearly a need for like better team management, who's in my org, make sure instance within the instance people in the org cannot see cannot accidentally share stuff outside the organization, better account management, all these things are needed. But I'm a bit afraid of that we might introduce workspaces or spaces or teams and that you can add people both in a group setting and you can have this alternative way. And we have two ways to kind of achieve the same thing and we increase confusion with our customers. Any, any Anybody has ideas about how to prevent that? I think that's a really good point. Um, so Amanda Hughes is our designer there. I don't see her on the call, but Mike Long is the manager, UX manager for Dev, and he's on the call. And I know he's he's talked to the PM about spaces. So I want to see if maybe he has some input. Um, 
only to the extent that we've actually talked about the concern, um, but I know it's top of mind for the PM and, and for Amanda. So I think that's yeah. part of the work that they're doing. Uh, part of the competitive analysis too is to understand uh, maybe how other uh, solutions address those types of uh, concerns as well. I'm trying to keep things yeah. simple. Yeah, I think, I think one, one, it's a super hard problem. So I, I don't know how to fix it. My two cents would be don't, because we call it spaces or teams, don't think that we have to create another concept. Maybe it's just taking the existing concept of groups and making sure that that works even better than it does today. Um, because two things to do the same thing is might be might be detrimental, but it's it's super tough. I don't have solutions. I completely agree with that. And I'll just add that the growth team is thinking about this quite a bit too, because in our user research, we know that as part of sign up flows, trial flows and things like that, people are super confused about the group concepts. So um, we plan to work closely with the product designer and the product manager in spaces so that we could kind of collaborate because we, we do research in a similar area. Cool. And I don't know, this, but yeah. Yeah, I can just chime in a little bit on that. Um, that's something we've had a lot of conversations around um, when it comes to subscriptions as well um, on the on the growth team. And that's something uh, Luca's the PM on that um, spaces. And we've had some conversations around with self-managed, you have this sort of concept of instance, and that's where your uh, subscription is applied. Um, that's where you're, that's sort of the like largest, uh, the largest encapsulating, um, I want to say group, but I don't want to use the word group, um, the largest sort of encapsulation. Um, whereas on .com, the largest like encapsulation in the place that your subscription is applied to is the group. Um, so there are some, there are some, uh, there are some areas where the instance level on self-managed gives the, gives the company a little more, um, customizability and control over, over their space that they don't have on .com. And I think both from a, uh, working perspective and also from like a subscription perspective. Um, I think that's sort of the, the, what spaces is trying to solve. Hey, I think you're on the money and, uh, maybe in my mind, if I had to pick a name right now, I'd call it a team. So it's not teams because teams is replacing groups. It's one team and you can add multiple groups to it or something like that. Um, it's just a thought, but it's a, it's a, I'm glad to hear everyone is thinking about this, uh, how to solve this without introducing duplication. And maybe in the end, we should have a concept that works so well that in self-managed, we also replace the existing instance-based things with the same concept. If I am allowed to jump back to one question from Sid, um, I was missing one uh, thing for the growth section in the slides where like we designed a new paid signup flow and that added uh, more info about the issue and a small demo um, in in the document. Thanks for that. I don't see anybody else typing. Are we all out of questions? Okay, I'll call it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. Bye. Thanks, Jackie.